Three decades ago, I was taught that every fish thrown back died, that we shouldn't do it, and we didn't. Two decades ago, I learned that it was wrong, but I had to prove that it was wrong, prove that fish did live, prove that what we threw back could make a huge difference in the quality of our fishing. I instituted a 9-inch size limit and tagged the heck out of sea bass, followed with a 16-inch tog limit and tagged them too. Years before management, it was making a difference, plain as day. That was the birth of catch restriction in these parts. And believe me, before then it was over the rail and into the pail. Now the simple biological truth that habitat is crucial in fisheries restoration must finally be dealt with. I couldn't begin to grasp that until I lowered an underwater camera. I now believe there can be no instance where real, firm, and lasting fishery restoration can be accomplished without habitat restoration. You see, reef restoration doesn't just make fishery restoration simple. It makes reef fish restoration possible. Ocean waves roll ashore just as they ever did. If you don't look too closely, everything appears as it ever was. I have been trying to get the corals and various other seafloor growths, our essential fish habitat, our reef, in the shallow nearshore waters of the Delmarva Peninsula found and protected for over a decade. About 110 miles from Washington, D.C., these are among the closest corals to the source of all our marine research funding. Yet I'll bet plenty of folks watching this video have no idea corals can be found in the mid-Atlantic, let alone in 65 feet of water just a few miles offshore where they vacationed for decades. Our region's reef habitat has remained veiled behind poor to non-existent seafloor analysis. Wigley and Thoreau's 1981 research paper found no hard bottom reef at all in the Mid-Atlantic. Steinle and Zetland's reef habitats in the Mid-Atlantic Bight from 2000 found that perhaps there were two areas of rock outcroppings, but mostly it was a handful of shipwrecks and artificial reefs that formed our hard bottom habitat. So strong are these scientific findings that a 2005 paper by Wallace and Hoff concluded that dredges weighing many tons whose water jets hydraulically liquefy the bottom were of no consequence to any significant benth benthic habitats in the Mid-Atlantic, and that should habitat impacts occur, they would be only temporary in nature. Well, during the regulated and wild expansion of the surf clam hydraulic dredge fishery in the 60s and 70s, there were ashtrays upon every table. And, like smoking, we didn't know of reef's importance then. Still don't really, but we ought to. Seeing what actually happens beneath that watery veil is indeed necessary. I have spoken with a great many skippers who witnessed our unregulated fisheries, men who lobbied to get foreign factory trawlers, the huge fishing ships out of our waters, men who tell fantastic stories of abundance, of white marlin caught within sight of land, men who could find our hard bottoms steering with only a compass and watch, men who picked through nets full of sea whip to gather their catch. These men witnessed that hard bottom shrink away, in some cases to nothing. Yet managers are still attempting to rebuild that huge reef fish populations of yesteryear with habitat remnants, with the reef leftovers of fishing's industrial revolution. The greatest irony is that success in habitat restoration leads to far better catches, which, under our current system, trips quotas and closes fisheries, a result which could not occur in a system that recognized habitat production. We do not understand, we cannot quantify how much habitat has been lost to fishing gear, or even that habitat can be lost to fishing gear, or that we even have habitat. Catch restriction management won't fix it. You simply cannot have reef fish in abundance without reef in abundance. I watched this reef impact occur on radar plotter, was about three miles away, watched as a trawl net was drawn across the reef, watched that sea whip get scraped away. I went back to film it a few days later. It was just one pass by a trawl skipper who I'd cheerfully break bed with any time. He was only doing what generations before have done. They pick up bottom trash sometimes. Even scientists call our rocks and growths, those sea whips, bottom trash when they come up in a net or dredge. That's funny. One man of trash is an ocean's treasure. A healthy and robust natural reef in 100 feet of water. This area is known as a hang, an obstruction a place to stay away from with stern-toed fishing gears. It has traps on it, likely has for generations. They yield sea bass, taut tog, and lobster for commercial fishers. Recreationally, we've not figured out how to catch lobster with a hook and line, but the tog, sea bass, and summer flounder are important. We've even caught codfish and bluefin tuna at this spot, and perhaps of greatest importance to the region's fisheries, squid. Three quarters of a mile inshore of that reef are these rocks, 
now six years since I filmed them, they are beginning to show signs of life again. I did not witness a gear impact here, but we used to catch fish there. Based on many years of observation, I can draw no other conclusion. These rocks should be reef, should offer production to the reef fisheries. Instead, they offered a day's catch to one crew and a decade's loss to all others. That trawling can cause habitat damage to reef is well documented in the regions around the world where habitat and the value of habitat is recognized by management. Much of our reef troubles come when summer flounder get on the rocks. I think we have perhaps 10% of our original natural reef footprint in production that 90% or more is lost. Here, however, is evidence that my estimate of lost habitat could be terribly low, that even more has been lost. The most robust boulders remain, often with substantial reef growth and battle scars. Evidenced by this giant tangle of trawl and trap gear lost to a single rock, there are gear conflicts in the commercial fisheries. At times worse than a hurricane, trap loss can be brutal. Stern-toed gears don't stand a chance against bad hangs, but usually the habitat loses. It seems to take the better part of a decade for growth to recolonize and restore the ecological function of reef. Restoration based on habitat production will benefit all fishers. The fishery restoration I envision surely employs catch restriction management, but at its core, habitat, both remnant and to be restored reef plus an artificial reef complex that can stand on its own. The Coast Guard asks, what went wrong in their investigations? Why did these men die? Why did this boat sink? Why did this boat survive when others did not? With pinpoint accuracy they learn, then go from there to make the public safer. Fishery management in the Mid-Atlantic is, thus far, only about catch restriction. Catches on paper at that. Tried for decades, our continued inaction on habitat issues won't work. Restoring the historical reef fish population with a fraction of the original habitat is an impossibility. Restoring reef fish will be made far simpler if a large habitat footprint can be recreated. There's a lot more to this. The Disney portrayal of natural reef as places of great beauty, while shipwrecks are shown as dark and foreboding places is highly misrepresentative. This popular dive location, a shipwreck in 75 feet of water, sank almost a century ago. On this day, the many resident sea bass were up in the water feeding on krill, amberjack, spadefish, triggerfish, numerous shark species, bluefish, scup, codfish, pollock, all and others. Squid too have used this reef. They did not know it was a wreck. They did not know it was an accidental artificial reef. Theirs is a simple response to habitat's function. Among many efforts to get more people go fishing, kids too, I think the single most important work is to make fishing better, to make fish populations more abundant so that catch may be increased. Some argue against artificial reef, claiming that it only draws fish populations away from natural reef, that artificial reef's sole purpose is to aggregate fish, to make them easier to catch. They hold that the life thriving on this shipwreck is in grave danger because there may be paint containing PCBs. How very poorly reasoned. There is only habitat production. Adding more habitat does not aggregate fish. It thins fish populations, temporarily. One day we'll understand habitat production's true value in holding capacity and measure it based on cubic volume. Everything thus far in this video has been in 20 fathoms of water or less. Yet even out to this 50 fathom reef and beyond, our region's reef is never more than a hard substrate on the bottom, easily replicated by rolling rocks off a barge. Our reef fisheries can be restored beyond belief with the rocks of Pennsylvanian farm fields. By creating huge reefs, we can make reef fishing better than it's ever been before. But there's deep distrust of artificial reef, perhaps sourcing mainly from the poorly engineered tire units of the 1970s washing ashore and knocking down Florida's natural reef. Infamy is their fate, yet here growing with the literature claims cannot happen. I suspect these corals will, in their slow succession, claim these well-constructed tire units proc completely. In the mid-Atlantic, our science lags. 
not only do we presently not officially have reef ecologies, but all the corals in this video, all of them, are officially classed as non-habitat forming. Here is an artificial reef sunk in 1969, filmed in March of 2007. Sank in 1969, is completely covered in corals. Look very closely at the very habitat forming, non-habitat forming corals that cover 100% of this reef unit. What great leap of science classed all our growths as non-habitat forming, I cannot imagine. It strikes me that anything growing on hard surface will suffice as habitat, and that our sea whips and star corals are indeed essential fish habitat of the first order. The debate over artificial reef will continue. Here I'm unsure if these rocks were calved from long ago iceberg or lost in recent decade from a barge in rough weather. I'm unsure if this is natural reef or accidental artificial reef. The decision is made even more difficult because the rocks are covered in lush growth and have abundant fish. Which of these are artificial? Ignorant of remnant natural reef, anti-artificial reef, strict adherence to delusional recreational catch estimates, and discarding basic fishery science have left the Mid-Atlantic with little solid progress in reef fish restoration. Our reef fish abundance into the early 2000s was due to good luck. Our present fishery limps along with little aid from management. I'd far rather have rocks. I know exactly how fish will respond to them. Reef fish restoration without thought of reef habitat must end. Habitat fidelity must be factored into quota management on regional scales. Habitat production too. Folks like abundant fish in every camp too. Trawlers will still trawl, clamors will still clam, just not right there, not right where that hard bottom is. It's not just the catching. Nearly a century of gear damage has hastened our fisheries decline. Reef building can accelerate the restoration. Believe it, reef restoration will make fishery restoration simple.